Tonight, the courtroom showdown in West Palm Beach. Lawyers for former President Trump squaring off with the Department of Justice over those classified documents seized at Mar-a-Lago. Trump's attorneys comparing those files to an overdue library book while arguing for a special master to sort through them. How soon we can expect a ruling from the judge. Plus, President Biden addressing the nation in prime time. His message on the growing threats to democracy. Tide turning blue? The upset in Alaska. Former Governor Sarah Palin defeated by a Democrat in a special election. Her loss, the latest in a string of setbacks for Trump-backed candidates. So what could this signal for the midterm elections? We'll have full analysis. Also tonight, the dangerous heat wave, soaring temperatures fueling fast-moving wildfires out west. More than 40 million Americans under alert. What residents are now being asked to do to prevent rolling blackouts. Extreme weather making crossings at the southern border all the more treacherous. Sweltering heat and flooding, driving a surge in migrant deaths. Morgues now forced to bring in refrigerated trucks. My officials fear many of the dead may never be identified. Plus, the disturbing video here in New York. A 78-year-old woman yanked from the back of a car by a driver who was supposed to take her to physical therapy. We'll have news on her condition tonight. And heading for home, the 12-year-old boy who fell from his bunk bed at the Little League World Series, finally leaving the hospital. How the slugger turned a 0% chance of survival into the ultimate comeback and the big name fans he earned along the way. Top Story starts right now. Good evening, I'm Gabe Gutierrez in for Tom. Tonight, for the first time since that FBI search at Mar-a-Lago, lawyers for the former president and the DOJ squaring off face to face. In front of a federal judge, Trump's attorneys arguing for an independent arbiter known as a special master to sort through those classified files. His team attempting to downplay the significance of the documents being stored at Trump's Florida home, likening top secret files to an overdue library book. The DOJ fighting to move forward without a special master, arguing they've already sorted through the seized material themselves. For more on the day in court and when we can expect a ruling, Here's Chief White House Correspondent Peter Alexander. Tonight, the showdown over government secrets. Lawyers for President Trump and Justice Department prosecutors facing off in a federal courtroom over Mr. Trump's request for an independent third party, what's known as a special master, to review documents seized in that controversial search at Mr. Trump's Mar-a-Lago home. Tonight, the judge saying she'll rule on that request at a later date. Mr. Trump's lawyers arguing the judge needed to help restore public confidence by allowing more transparency into the government's actions and dismissing the investigation into the former president's keeping highly classified documents, comparing them to an overdue library book. The Justice Department opposes an independent review of the documents, saying they've already gone through them and acknowledging more than 500 pages may be protected by attorney-client privilege. The DOJ argues the classified documents belong to the U.S., not to Mr. Trump. Quote, because he is no longer the president, he had no right to take those documents. The judge today also saying she'll make public a more detailed list of what the FBI seized at Mr. Trump's estate. Tonight, Mr. Trump is zeroing in on this evidence photo of top secret documents in the DOJ filing that he says FBI agents staged in his office to sway public opinion. They took documents and they put them all over the floor. And th then they deceptively put out that picture. For weeks, Mr. Trump and his allies have argued that he declassified the documents, but his lawyers have not made that argument in court. In a filing last night saying it should have been fully anticipated that the former president would have had sensitive material at his home and that the special master should possess a top secret security clearance. Meanwhile, Mr. Trump is speaking out about January 6th, saying he's financially supporting some accused rioters. It's a disgrace what they've done to them. If I decide Amen. to run and if I win, I will be looking mm. very, very strongly about pardons. Amen. Full pardons. It comes the same day a retired NYPD officer received the longest sentence yet, 10 years, for using a metal flagpole to assault a Capitol Police officer.
And Peter Alexander joins us now live on Top Story. Peter, good to see you in person. We've just learned that two former Trump White House officials will testify tomorrow before a grand jury. Yeah, that's right. This is potentially very significant here. We're going to be hearing from, or we won't hear publicly, but they're going to be testifying in private, the former White House counsel to President Trump, Pat Cipollone, as well as his deputy. They're expected to appear before this federal grand jury uh, in Washington, D.C., the grand jury investigating the events surrounding the January 6th Capitol attack. These men are notable because they were both key witnesses in those final days of the Trump presidency game. Peter Alexander, thanks for joining Top Story. A lot to watch tomorrow. Now to power and politics. Less than two months to the midterms, all eyes are on Alaska and a key victory for Democrats in the race for the state's only House seat. Former State Representative Mary Peltola clinching a special election against former Governor Sarah Palin and businessman Nick Begich. But the three will have to face off again in November. NBC News correspondent Vaughn Hillier joins us now from Florida. And Vaughn, this was an unusual election in some ways. Special election, first one with ranked choice voting. But we also saw the Trump effect on full display with his candidate of choice, Sarah Palin, of course. This is the second competitive uh, House special election Democrats have won, Pat Ryan from New York being the first. But how are Democrats viewing this win? Yeah, these are significant victories. Of course, these two new Democratic members of Congress will only serve the, through the rest of this year here. But they are indicators that Democrats actually got a better shot than they were maybe looking at uh, just uh, even a few weeks ago. In some of, I mean, we're talking about Alaska. Donald Trump won Alaska in 2020 by 10 percentage points. But Alaska, I think, is really kind of hits at the crux of the American political ecosystem right now. They have this ranked choice voting here. And you saw that Nick Begich, he was a Republican as well. But when folks had the opportunity to choose who their second choice was, half of them selected Sarah Palin, who was the Trump endorsed candidate. But the other half either did not choose anybody or chose the Democrats. So you can kind of see where in the Republican Party there's this fracture that allowed the Democrat here to win. And so the Republican Party as a whole, you have seen them consistently pick these Trump-backed allied candidates. But come general election, if it's those types of candidates that Democrats are going up right now, Democrats are feeling good about their chances in some of these Senate and House races. Yeah, Vaughn, so a Wall Street Journal poll found that if the midterms were held today, 47 percent of voters would support Democrats, 44 percent would back Republicans. So a lot can happen between now and November. But what are Republicans viewing as their winning strategy from here? Right. The Republicans have found that the Dobb decision overturning Roe uh, was significant and has moved the numbers substantially, that there is a, a great turnout among not only Democratic and independent pro-choice voters, but even Republicans. I've had those conversations with Republican uh, pro-choice voters who have said that they'd be willing to go and vote for Democrats this November. And that is where you've seen the likes of several candidates, including like the U.S. Senate candidate, Blake Masters in Arizona, try to walk back his position. At one point, he was for a personhood law that would outright ban abortions, but you have suddenly walk, walked back and tried to narrow the scope in which he believes abortions should be illegal. The hard part is, is that he's got a record here, and you are seeing this among candidates here around the country in these last 85 days try to change their tune to appeal to a greater swath of the electorate. And Vaughn, you're in Florida. We've been following your reporting. You've been speaking to residents about the search of Mar-a-Lago. So do you have a sense that this, that search, will change voters' mind at all, or, or will supporters of the former president stick with him no matter what? I think it's important to note, uh, to your question, Gabe, that Donald Trump has been on the forefront, uh, you know, even doing interviews as, as early as this afternoon here to combat this as a political witch hunt, a political operation to undermine not only his power, but the so-called MAGA movement's influence around the country here. He harkens back to the Mueller probe. Of course, the two impeachment proceedings against him here and is pushing this aside as another. In conversations with, you know, Trump loyalists around the country that I have had over just these last three weeks even, but also over the course of the last two years in the aftermath of the January 6th insurrection, there are millions of loyal voters 
to Donald Trump in the efforts of this so-called America First movement here. Donald Trump has even suggested that he's looking at a 2024 presidential run here, and he is using himself and these investigations into him uh, as martyrdom. And uh, the idea that he is of the utmost concern to not only Joe Biden, the Department of Justice, the so-called deep state, and he is trying to use these investigations to his political advantage. But that's why you're going to see Joe Biden tonight counter with this speech addressing, the, 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 in his words, the threats to democracy posed by the likes of those who are allies with Donald Trump. There is a lot at stake here as we head toward these midterm elections this November, Gabe. Vaughn Hilliard, live for us in West Palm Beach, Florida. Vaughn, thank you. Now to Philadelphia, where President Biden is set to give a speech on the battle for the soul of the nation. The president expected to address threats to democracy and the nation's deepening divide during the primetime remarks. NBC News senior White House correspondent Kelly O'Donnell joins us now. And Kelly, what more do we expect to hear from President Biden tonight? Well, good to be with you, Gabe. And advisors have told us that President Biden has been thinking about this speech for quite some time. And the idea of the soul of the nation has been one of the animating forces behind his presidency. It's part of what he talked about when he chose to run. And it's part of what he wants to sort of bring to uh, the national conversation, the idea that we all have to stand up for freedoms and that there is at stake right now, real jeopardy to some of the things that have been a part of American life for a long time. Kinds of freedoms he's talking about would be access to abortion, a constitutional right for a half century that is no more, and concerns that some Americans have about what might happen to the right to marry or other kinds of issues. He wants to talk about the fact that political violence has become talked about and real in too many instances, and that that is a danger that is an ongoing threat and one that Americans really need to think about, that there is space to disagree on policy and to have very different views about the role of government in America, but there should be agreement on when an election is held, that at the time it comes to a conclusion, Americans agree that it's over and then move on together. So the White House says this is not a political speech. Well, that might be hard to convince some Americans 10 weeks before the midterm elections. And when we know from released excerpts that the president will call out MAGA extremism, which is so closely tied to former President Trump. But they say it's bigger than one election cycle. It's bigger than uh, the coming midterm uh, results. And that it is about trying to focus Americans on values uh, that relate to a much broader group uh, than those who might be voting in November. Kevin McCarthy, the House Republican leader, spoke in Scranton, Pennsylvania, choosing that, the hometown of President Biden, a short time ago. And he was very explicitly making a political speech, saying that Joe Biden should apologize for calling out mega supporters of former President Trump. So there are certainly political overtones. The White House says it's bigger than that. The Americans who watch this speech tonight will be able to judge for themselves. Gabe? Kelly O'Donnell at the White House. Kelly, thank you. Now to the growing crisis we've been reporting on in Mississippi. The city of Jackson, without safe drinking water for the fourth straight day. The National Guard now arriving, bringing much-needed help. Morgan Chesky is there. Tonight in Jackson, the mission couldn't be more clear. I have an idea, man. Hundreds of National Guardsmen handing out clean water to a nearly non-stop line of cars. The site one of seven, just opened by the state. It's sad, um, and I can't even afford to move out of Jackson, so I have to stay here and, and deal with this. Today at the treatment plant, left crippled by recent floods, water pressure improved. But the advice to everyone who relies on it remained the same. You can shower or bathe. Please make sure in the shower that your mouth's not open, because again, you do not want to ingest the water currently. With the boil water notice now in place for the last month, the growing toll hitting hard. People are fed up. They're running to bordering cities who have clean water to just bathe. At a nearby medical clinic, a loss in pressure temporarily knocked out AC units. Tankers are now the only source of clean water. It was hot. <laughs> it was it was humid. There was a lot of humidity in the building. Despite uncertainty being the only certainty, the city's mayor Equitable staying hopeful. When folks here in Jackson ask, how much longer will I have to come pick up bottled water? Mm -hmm. What do you tell them? The good news is that we are seeing um, some good days. So today is a good day. Uh, last night was a good night. 
uh, and we're seeing recovery in the system. Uh, if that maintains, then you know, we can see pressure restored in the very near future, maybe a couple of days from now. And Morgan Chesky joins us now from a National Guard water distribution site in Ridgeland, Mississippi. Morgan, we know you spoke extensively with the mayor today about the recovery efforts there. Is more help on the way? Yeah, Gabe, it certainly is. In fact, the director of FEMA expected to visit Jackson come tomorrow. There will be more federal and state resources, according to leaders, pouring into this community over the next few days and weeks. But there is still no firm timeline on when this ailing water treatment plant will finally come back fully online the way in which it should. In the meantime, officials say anyone who needs fresh water can come to one of these seven water distribution sites that opened up today and will remain open for the foreseeable future. Gabe. Morgan Chesky in Mississippi. Morgan, thank you. And in the West, a dangerous and potentially deadly heat wave gripping the region. Tens of millions under heat watches as triple digit temperatures strain the power grid and fuel new wildfires. Miguel Almaguer reports. Facing a series of explosive new wildfires and now under the daily threat of looming blackouts, tonight most of California and some 40 million Americans across the West are suffering through unbearable heat. With this heat coming up, it's probably going to be at home most of the week, honestly. Cities pushed to the extreme. Forecasted highs today in Utah, Arizona, Nevada and California, all well above 100 degrees. The heat is too much for me. With heat killing more Americans than any other extreme weather event, highs across the region are breaking records, soaring 20 degrees above average. I've never dealt with something this hot before. The sustained and extraordinary heat wave is expected to last nearly a week. Outside Los Angeles, where fires raged before sunrise, several firefighters were treated for heat exhaustion as overnight lows hovered in the 80s. Very rapid fire growth and very, very explosive fire behavior. And now amid growing concerns over rolling blackouts, authorities are pleading for conservation. It comes as cities like Phoenix hire heat officers to create a plan on how to adapt to a warming planet. We have hundreds of people dying in our county here in Arizona from heat each year, so it is, it is a catastrophic hazard. Tonight, planning for an uncertain future while facing a dangerous present. To help the power grid, residents in California are being asked not to use large appliances, not to charge their electric vehicles, and turn up their AC units between 4 and 9 p.m. But at that hour, it could still be nearly triple digits outside. Gabe. Miguel Amager, thank you. For more on the severe weather sweeping the nation, I want to bring in NBC News meteorologist Michelle Grossman. Michelle, what's the latest on the track? Hey there, Gabe. Well, we're looking at temperatures right now near 109 in some spots. So, so many spots in the triple digits. We're going to see these numbers tomorrow, also through the weekend, into early next week. So, this is a prolonged event, and that makes it much more dangerous. Taking a look at temperatures right now, we're looking at triple digits in many, many spots. 105 right now in Phoenix, 109 in Las Vegas. And it's all due to a heat dome in place. So, 45 million Americans under a heat alert. We're looking at heat advisories from the Northwest or the Intermountain West, excessive heat warnings. That includes Sacramento, Fresno, Los Angeles, San Diego. You're going to see temperatures into the triple digits for a few days. And here is that area of high pressure. It's a big heat dome. It's anchored in place. It's literally a heat pump just pumping in this really hot air. It's going to stay in place through next week. And we're going to see this heat wave extending a long, long time. And it's bringing temperatures up quite a bit, 10, 15, 20, even 30 degrees above normal for this time of year. So that's something to watch. We're going to see uh, increased risk for a heat illness, also fire, wildfires. As Miguel said, it's very dry. It's hot. We're also going to be windy as we go throughout uh, the next couple of days, and that's going to increase the risk. So looking at temperatures for tomorrow, into the triple digits. Once again, Pasadena, 100 degrees. That's seven degrees above what is typical for this time of year. Las Vegas, 109. San Jose, you're into the 90s as well. And as we go into this Labor Day weekend, a lot of people outside, we're looking at those sweltering temperatures once again. Sacramento, 104. Sunday, 107. And 111, Gabe, by Monday. Back to you. Wow, Michelle Grossman, thank you. Danger brought on by the heat. The tragic stories of children dying after getting left in scorching hot vehicles two of these incidents in just the last week. But now, car companies are trying to solve the problem with new technology. Stephen Romo reports. 
the death of a two-year-old girl left in a hot car. How can that happen? You know, how do you forget? I guess we're all forgetful. You know, I've forgotten things in the car, but how do you forget the toddler? You know, I mean, I, I don't know. Neighbors in New Jersey describing to NBC New York the pain from her parents after the discovery. The dad screaming uncontrollably, um, and then I heard the mom start wailing, like really sobbing. The tragic incident, the 22nd death nationwide this summer, according to the organization Kids in Car Safety. The truth of the matter is this can happen to anybody at any time. And, and the biggest mistake anyone can ever, ever make is to think that this couldn't happen to them. And just this past weekend in North Carolina, two little girls are dead. Amora and Trinity's grandfather saying they were left in a hot car. Their mother, Lanise Battle, is being held behind bars without bond. Ms. Battle, you're here today charged with two counts of murder in the first degree. If convicted, you could get up to life without parole or the death penalty. Her cousin coming to her defense. She's a caring and loving mother to her kids at the end of the day. She's not a cold-blooded murderer. And in Washington, D.C., a three-month-old was inside a car for two hours last month. Three-month-old male, cardiac arrest. Uh, current rhythm is officially on CPR for about eight minutes. Eighty-seven percent of the children who die in hot cars are three or under. So it's very young. Almost half the time that a child is forgotten, the caregiver meant to drop them off at daycare or preschool. It happens most often at the end of the work week, Thursdays and Fridays, according to the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration. But now some car companies are trying to come up with technological solutions specifically to detect the presence of a child or pet. Tesla is seeking FCC approval for a motion sensing device that could help prevent children from being left behind in hot cars. Tesla saying the sensors would work to detect, quote, micro movements like breathing patterns and heart rates and would be able to see through soft materials like a blanket. Toyota, Hyundai, Nissan and General Motors also expanding their technology. Nissan and GM's alerts will monitor if a rear door has recently been opened or closed and display a message for drivers when exiting the vehicle to check the back. And Stephen Romo joins us now on set. And Stephen, we just heard right there about this new technology that some car makers are rolling out of that could help. Any idea on a timeline for when that could actually be rolled out? Yeah, that's such a key piece to this, Gabe. Some of it is being rolled out right now, but it's not across the board just yet. However, major U.S. automakers did make a promise to consumers saying that they will voluntarily install rear seat reminder systems to most all of their vehicles by 2025. Alert systems, though, based on the doors that have not been opened. The expert we talked to in our story, she says they may not be the best way to go. She recommends instead sensors that can actually detect a living being, a, a pet or a child being in the car. She says that would make them far more safer. Yeah, Stephen, we've covered these hot car deaths for so long, but good to see that new technology uh, being rolled out. Yeah. Thank you so much, Stephen Romo. Still ahead tonight, the passenger attacked on her way to a physical therapy appointment. Video showing the 78-year-old woman on the ground fighting with her driver, the Good Samaritan, who stepped in to help. Plus, the new warning from the FD, from the DEA, the rainbow-colored pills they're urging kids to stay away from. And officer knockout, a New York cop seen punching a woman, sending her to the ground. The second angle just released and how the mayor is responding tonight. Top story is just getting started. Next tonight, violence in the streets caught on camera. The victims, a 78-year-old woman and the Good Samaritan who tried to protect her. NBC's Julie Serkin has the latest, and we want to warn you, the video is graphic. Tonight, a shocking incident. Guys, guys, what's going on? Call the police! He my phone! He Can you give her the phone? Can you give her the phone? This is an old woman. Please! Hello? Please. Can you not do that? Can you not stop and run away? You're gonna have to, you're gonna have to run over. Whoa! Whoa! The horrifying moments captured on camera and posted to Twitter of an accessoride driver dragging his 78-year-old passenger out of the car. This is an old woman. The dispute starting when the taxi driver, identified by his employer as Mohammed Ahmed El Sakran, drove past the woman's destination. According to the NYPD, police say Catherine Shine asked him to go back, but he refused. 
pulling her out and onto the ground instead. You can see the woman struggling to get up, her cane in hand. I want my phone. A good Samaritan intervening to help her, and he too was allegedly struck by the driver, according to police. You're gonna have to, you're gonna have to run over. Whoa! Whoa! I was just trying to stop him from leaving. I, I, obviously, in hindsight, it wasn't a good idea. Police say the woman was taken to a local hospital and is expected to recover. Access or Ride provides free or low cost transportation for New Yorkers who have disabilities preventing them from using public buses and subways. The city's Taxi and Limousine Commission, which licenses and regulates for hire vehicles, suspending the driver's license. The agency also saying in a statement that it is working with the NYPD on their investigation. Mrs. Shine, who was on her way to a physical therapy nice, appointment, nice. had never on? used an accessoride car service before, her daughter says. Her Amazing woman. She really was very brave to and strong to go through something so traumatic. Accessoride trips are back up to pre-pandemic levels, according to MTA data, with nearly 800,000 relying on the service in June alone. We really encourage older adults not to stay home and watch TV. I do applaud Accessoride. It's, it's better than staying home by yourself. According to the CDC, 40% of Americans 65 or older are living with a disability, and nearly 14% of adults in the U.S. have a mobility disability. Are you okay? No, I'm not. I'm a 78-year-old lady that he threw me out of the camp. He is the best. He was wonderful. He helped my mother out. Thank God for him. He really, he was, he was a hero. The New York State Federation of Taxi Drivers saying, quote, the video is brutal and shows no compassion or respect for the elderly. Muhammad's actions will not be tolerated. We hope that the person who did this to my mother gets brought to justice. NBC News has not been able to contact Elsa Kron or his family. That video really is tough to watch. And Julie joins us now here in studio. And Julie, the you know elderly often get taken advantage of, but this example just happened to be caught on camera. Egg, that's exactly right. This was absolutely heart-wrenching to watch, but it's more common than you might imagine. One in 10 Americans over the age of 65 actually say they've been abused, whether that's emotionally, mentally, or physically, like in this case. And I should also note the DA's office says that no charges have been filed in this case so far. Julie Serkin, thanks so much for joining Top Story. Staying in New York and to more violence caught on camera, the NYPD releasing body cam video that shows an officer punching a woman in the face before she falls to the ground and hits her head on the pavement. Her family's speaking out now, but Mayor Eric Adams saying the officer showed restraint. Ron Allen has the story. Tonight, the New York City Police Department releasing this body cam video amid mounting controversy. An officer accused of punching a woman in the face in Harlem last Tuesday after she appears to take a swing at him during an arrest. The body cam video cutting out shortly after the blow, but you can hear shocked onlookers shouting at the officers. Police said officers were there to arrest a man for attempted murder before the altercation happened. Earlier this week, cell phone video showed the incident where the woman can be seen falling back and hitting her head on the pavement. Tamani Crum, a hairdresser, is now charged with assaulting an officer, resisting arrest, and obstruction. Her mother speaking to NBC New York outside of the police precinct. I get, like, blown away to see this happen to my daughter. You know, it's, it's so painful for a mother to see that. WNBC reporting the NYPD says at least three people who allegedly tried to interfere were also arrested. The girl's grandmother also speaking out, disturbed by what happened. He shouldn't have never, never, never put his hands on her or any female. He's wrong. He's wrong. The NYPD says it has launched an investigation into the August 30th incident, a police union and New York City's mayor defending the officer's conduct. The young lady came, smacked the police officer, the police officer responded. I think those officers on the scene showed great restraint. They did what the system called for. They didn't turn off their body cameras. That's why we have footage of what happened. 
And the Detectives Endowment Association President Paul D. Giacomo saying, quote, when you assault a New York City detective in order to interfere with an arrest of a man armed with a gun, there are repercussions. NBC New York reporting there have been six complaints over the last 10 years against Officer Kendo Kinsey, according to the Civilian Complaint Review Board. Some of them for use of force violations, but none were substantiated. Crum's mother has hired an attorney. This has to stop. And we are seeking full accountability in this action. The community reacting, gathering outside Kinsey's precinct, demanding he lose his job. Ron Allen, NBC News, New York. And when we come back, the major SUV recall. Ford pulling nearly 200,000 vehicles off the road after dozens caught on fire. We'll have the models affected next. Back now with Top Stories News Feed, and we begin with the deadly stabbing at a North Carolina high school. Police say a fight broke out at the main entrance of the school in Jacksonville early this morning. At least one student killed, another arrested. Two other people, including a teacher, were injured. The school was shut down for the day and will remain closed until Tuesday. Chicago is now the latest city involved in a political battle over immigration. New video shows 75 migrants, many from Venezuela, arriving in the city late last night. Texas Governor Greg Abbott has sent buses of asylum seekers from Texas to cities with Democratic mayors, including D.C. and New York. Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot called his actions, quote, racist and xenophobic, but says migrants are welcome there. The DEA has issued warnings on brightly colored fentanyl that may appeal to young people. The so-called rainbow, fent rainbow fentanyl has been seized by authorities in at least 18 cities across the U.S. It's been found in pill, powder, and block form. It could be mistaken for candy. And Ford is recalling nearly 200,000 SUVs over major fire risks. The recall affects 2015 to 2017 models of the Ford Expedition and Lincoln Navigator. The company says the SUVs are at risk of catching fire due to malfunctions in fan motors. So far, at least 25 fires have been reported, including a dozen that resulted in major damage to the vehicle and one injury. Dealers will be notified starting September 12th. Turning now to the latest travel chaos, off-duty pilots picketing outside some of the nation's busiest airports, and the government is launching a new tool travelers can turn to if their flight is canceled or delayed. Tom Costello has more on what to expect this Labor Day weekend. End of the summer, and the airlines insist they're on the rebound after a rough summer season. But tonight, the government is posting a scorecard. How airlines treat customers when they cancel or delay flights because of mechanical or staffing issues, pushing the airlines to do better. The new Airline Customer Service Dashboard at DOT.gov details what each airline will and won't do for customers, from rebooking fees to meal and hotel vouchers if flights are delayed or canceled. While the big airlines mostly get green check marks, many smaller carriers get a lot of red X's. If it's a broken plane or a missing crew or who showed up late, I hate that. If it's weather, you get it. Since Memorial Day weekend, 50,000 flights canceled, 517,000 delayed, including 22% of all flights in August alone. Houston Center, uh, looks like you got pretty good skies right now. Anything? Meanwhile, at the FAA Command Center today, they're watching 47 7,000 flights nationwide, the busiest of the extended Labor Day weekend. This has been a rough summer. It has been a rough summer. Weather is always our most challenging time frame, uh, convective weather. The good news, very few volatile storms are on the radar today. But across the country, off-duty pilots from the biggest pilots union in contract talks are again picketing over poor airline service and complaining they are overworked and underpaid. It's just like the passengers. We're frustrated with all the delays and cancellations. It affects us as well. Delta says the union's goal is to gain leverage at the negotiating table. Meanwhile, 38 state attorneys general have now written to Congress saying that they have received thousands of complaints from people across the country that they are upset with the airlines because they say the airlines are not giving them credit for flights they were supposed to take during the pandemic. The state AGs want the permission, want the authority to be able to enforce federal consumer protection laws as it relates to the airlines. I'm Tom Costello in Washington. Back to you.
Tom, thank you. Turning now to money talks, what consumers and investors need to know from the business world and beyond. With home prices still at historic highs, home ownership is out of reach for many Americans. And now Bank of America is taking an unprecedented step to help minorities achieve that dream. The bank is launching a mortgage program with zero down payment for certain black and Latino communities in the U.S. I want to bring in Andre Perry now. He's a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and author of Know Your Price, Valuing Black Lives and Property in America's Black Cities. Andre, thank you so much for joining us here on Top Story. Uh, this program is called the Community Affordable Loan Solution. In addition to not requiring a down payment, people won't need a minimum credit score. So who will be eligible for one of these loans? Well, people who are generally low wealth, we know that present and past day discrimination prohibited people from acquiring assets, particularly um, the ability to buy a home. And that, um, uh, those actions really um, set people back for generations moving forward. And so th this um, program will deal with uh, the, the two major issues that prohibit black and brown people in particular from owning a home, and that is down payment and um, closing costs. And we know that the black-white um, um, racial wealth gap is um, white, white families have about eight times the wealth as, as black families, about seven times the wealth of, of um, Latino families. And that really shows up in um, the ability to put down a down payment and, and pay for closing fees. So, Andre, critics of this plan, though, are pointing to 2008 and the housing crisis, which was fueled in part by subprime mortgage loans to riskier borrowers. So, are these borrowers now being potentially set up to fail if the economy tanks? Well, a lot of this, this program was really set up by the government sponsored, sponsored enterprises, um, better known as Freddie and Fannie, when they um, facilitated um, the um, um, credit score or uh, rental payments to be in, in, in included into credit scores. And, and because of that, um, there are many invisible prime borrowers that we just simply overlook. So this is, is not necessarily um, finding riskier um, um, borrowers. No, it's actually finding the people who are doing everything um, that would warrant a high credit score, but they just never had the assets um, to get that 700, to get that 720. So there are many prime borrowers out there. They just need a loan product that suits them. Andre Perry from the Brookings Institution. Andre, thank you. Now to Top Stories Global Watch and the major city in China shutting down over new COVID infections. Chinese officials placing 21 million people on lockdown in Chengdu after 150 people there tested positive for the virus. It's the latest action by China still enforcing its zero COVID policy. And now to a suspicious death of a Russian oil magnate in Moscow. Local authorities say the Luke Oil chairman fell out the window of his hospital room into his death. Luke Oil is one of Russia's largest oil companies and came out against the war in Ukraine just days after the invasion. The death coming just four months after another person connected to the company was discovered dead in his home. And record wildfires are scorching the Amazon rainforest this summer. Brazilian authorities say the rainforest saw the most fire alerts in the month of August since 2010. The rainforest also suffered more fires last month than in nearly five years. Experts say illegal deforestation in the Amazon is to blame. And turning now to the war in Ukraine and a warning tonight from the U.N. as inspectors get the first look at a nuclear power plant after months of shelling in the area. Josh Letterman is there. Tonight, the UN's nuclear watchdog says the world cannot tolerate more damage to Europe's largest nuclear power plant after inspectors finally got a first-hand look at damage from months of shelling. I have just completed a first tour of the key areas. The head of the International Atomic Energy Agency inspecting the plant for five hours, then issuing this warning. It is obvious that, that the plant uh, and the physical integrity of the plant has been violated. <laughs> Just hours earlier, the unprecedented mission to the Russian health plant was threatened by intense shelling before and during the inspector's journey across the front lines. Fighting so fierce, a nuclear reactor was shut down, and the head of Zaporizhia's regional administration feared the mission would be called off. 
He says, in terms of intensity, this was one of the heaviest attacks. Both Ukraine and Russia blame each other for violence around the plant. In nearby Zaporizhia, residents fearing the worst, lining up for iodine tablets, instructed to take them within six hours if radiation leaks. Svetlana Groha has a seven-month-old baby. Do you worry that you might have to give iodine to your baby? She says, yes, because I don't know how it will affect my child. At the nuclear plant, a handful of UN experts remain there tonight and will keep working there for several more days. Gabe? Josh Letterman, thank you. Staying in Ukraine, over the past six months, we have seen the war take its toll. One group in particular, mothers, have been at the forefront, witnessing and documenting the reality on the ground. NBC's Molly Hunter and her team have traveled across Ukraine, listening to those gut-wrenching stories. And they're bringing us a powerful documentary told through the eyes of these brave women. Molly, what struck you the most? Hey, Gabe, I think one of the reasons that this documentary came together is because when we showed up at these towns and villages that had been occupied for weeks uh, by Russian troops, it was the women who were still there. It was the women who had survived. It was the women who wanted to tell me and my team their stories. And it was often the women, Gabe, who were most vulnerable under occupation by Russian troops. I want to share a short excerpt with your audience. Marina flags us down as we arrive in Bordianka. She starts telling us about her neighbor's son before we start recording her audio. It's early April. After five weeks of occupation, Russian troops left a few days ago. We're some of the first people Marina sees. She takes us back to the house, to the shallow grave. His mom. His mom. Okay. The person who's buried, and she will tell the whole story. That's what she said. Okay. 81-year-old Thaisa says her son Roman was just 57. She's a widow. He was her only child still alive. And during the occupation, he returned home just to check on her. Thaisa explains one afternoon in mid-March, he asked Russian troops at a checkpoint for a cigarette. After they gave him one, as he walked away, they shot him in the back. And Molly Hunter joins us again from London. Molly, thank you for sharing that important reporting with us. What struck me is that emotion was just so raw right after the Russian occupations. I was in the suburbs of Kyiv after they had spent several weeks uh, under Russian uh, control. But Molly, you know, it's incredible to watch these mothers having to bury their sons. It's so heartbreaking. What about some of those other mothers that had to make the gut-wrenching decision to leave Ukraine you know, with their children, some are now deciding to go back. How difficult was that decision for these mothers? Yeah, I actually gave one of the women that uh, is featured in this documentary uh, is a woman named Ina. Um, Ina's 31. She's a single mother. She's from Kharkiv. It's the easternmost city. And it was hit very, very hard at the beginning of the war because it's so close to the Russian border. Ina's nine-year-old son, Danya, has blood cancer. And they were in Kharkiv at one of uh, the leading cancer hospitals uh, for pediatric patients in the country. They got evacuated to Lviv, Gabe. Uh, and then they had to choose what was best for her family, what was best for her 
her son was to get out of the country. So they're now living in Amsterdam. Um, they are getting great treatment in Amsterdam, but leaving her support system, leaving her family, leaving the war-torn country with her nine-year-old son, who desperately needed uh, chemotherapy and needed treatment, was one of uh, the stories that really stuck with me. And I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what our audience thinks of that one. Molly Hunter in London on these heartbreaking decisions that will likely be felt for years, if not generations to come. Molly, thank you. And you can catch more of Molly's reporting tonight, A Mother's War. It airs tonight at 11 p.m. Eastern, right here on NBC News Now. Coming up next, deadly journey, the difficult images out of Texas of makeshift graves and overrun morgues, why so many migrants are heading to the southern border and then losing their lives along the way. That's next. Now to the Americas and the grim reality at our southern border. Officials in Texas reporting a disturbing increase in migrant deaths, the journey north becoming more and more dangerous as severe weather plagues the south. NBC's Priscilla Thompson reports. In Eagle Pass, Texas, rows of makeshift crosses mark the final resting place of unidentified migrants. The gravedigger here tells Telemundo more than he's ever buried before. Across the border, migration fell for the second month in a row in July, but crossings are still at an all-time high, with Border Patrol reporting more than 1.8 million apprehensions from October. October 2021 through July, more than double the 860,000 reported during the same time in 2019. As the number of people making the perilous journey increases, often battling unprecedented weather from sweltering heat to record rainfall and flooding, so too does the number who die. Among the bodies recovered, a five-year-old girl who was swept out of her mother's arms last month and drowned just across the border from El Paso. Es donde más triste se sienten tratando de auxiliar al, al, al de dos meses y sabiendo que el hermanito de tres años falleció. And the morgues in those border towns are running out of space. The busiest I've ever been in my entire career. By this time last year, 196 migrants had died in Webb County. That number, now 218. The remains of the dead now overflowing into the morgue's parking lot, where five refrigerated trucks hold 260 bodies and growing by the day, a fate that advocates say isn't inevitable. Y es algo que no debe de estar pasando, no deberían de estar perdiendo sus vidas uh, si tuviéramos un sistema eficiente, o sea, ya es algo que creo que muchos de nuestros líderes, verdad, no 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 comprenden. And now there's a new challenge. More and more migrants are coming from places like Peru, Nicaragua, and Colombia, which don't have embassies near the border, making it harder to identify and return those who die to their loved ones. Me da mucha tristeza porque no sabemos quién son estas personas. Even as so many of the dead remain unidentified, still, the grave digger in Eagle Pass places a cross at the head of each body he buries, marking the loss of each life. Priscilla Thompson, NBC News. Those grave markings, haunting images. When we come back, heading for home, one little leaguer's incredible recovery in the moment, three weeks in the making. Stay with us. Finally tonight, a Little Leaguer's incredible recovery. His injury shocked the sport, but his comeback is captivating the nation. That boy East. Woo! Yeah, buddy. Tonight, a beloved Little Leaguer is heading for home. Woo! <laughs> Easton the Tank Oliverson, showing the world just how tough he is. Just three weeks ago, Easton fell off a bunk bed in Pennsylvania before his team's first game in the Little League World Series. Doctors told his family to expect the worst. We came off with those stats of 0% chance survival to a week and a half later of them expecting him 100% recovery. His all-star team of physicians removed a part of Easton's skull to allow his brain to swell. Then, from coast to coast, the biggest stars in baseball rallied around one of their own. 
Easton, what's up, buddy? Heard about the fall. Just want to let you know we're all thinking about you. Boys at Tiger Stadium. Hey, Easton. Well soon, buddy. Easton, this is Matt Carpenter with the New York Yankees. Um, just wanted to let you know that we are thinking about you, man. We're praying for you. Easton even got a shout out from his favorite player. Hey, Easton, it's Mookie Betts. I just want you to know that we are praying for you, thinking of you, and I hope to see you soon, my man. I mean, that video that Mookie sent was just a huge blessing for Easton to motivate him, to get him going. That motivation, helping Easton through a second surgery and therapy. Every day, another small step, yep, eating, good job. walking, Nice job. And speaking. Hey, this is Easton. Thank you for the prayers. You fit starting to feel better, bud? Yeah, I'm starting to feel better. During one of his therapy sessions, the tank riding, I love the Boston Red Sox. Okay. Easton, Alex Gora here from the Boston Red Sox, from the coaches, the players, training staff, and Red Sox Nation. You're going to be okay, kid. With seemingly all of baseball behind him, this little leaguer, now in his home state of Utah, is stopping to say thank you. Hi everyone, this is Easton. Thank you for all of your prayers. Please keep praying for me as, as I continue to get better. We're all cheering for you, Easton. Thanks for watching. Good night. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.